Hello, my name is Ariel Goodbody, and today I'm going to do something a bit different. I'm going to talk about my experience with autistic catatonia. So you might know that last year, in 2022, I took a six-month break from the podcast, and this was because of this health problem, autistic catatonia. I'm going to explain what that means, how I experience it, and basically give some updates compared to last year. So autism, hopefully you've heard of it because it's a lot to explain as well as catatonia, but autism is basically uh, a different way of thinking, I guess. Um, it's traditionally treated as a problem, a disorder, a way that your brain develops, grows differently. But I really see autism as just a different way of thinking and existing in the world. And one of the things, for example, that autistic people experience is we are much more sensitive to um, bright lights, loud sounds, certain types of food, sensations, um, the sensory experience, basically. So I'm making this video for my Patreon supporters who will see it a month before everyone else. I'm making it for, you know, people generally who are interested in the topic, who listen to my podcast, and then also maybe for people who don't listen to my podcast and maybe are native speakers of English but they are autistic or they know someone who is autistic and they are maybe going through similar things themselves or they're just curious. So um, I'm making this video with absolute minimum effort. Normally with my videos, I put in a lot more effort into preparing them and uh, how I perform them. But today is going to be completely one take. That means I am not going to edit this video. So I will probably talk very slowly. I will probably stop and start. I will probably say things wrong and have to correct myself. I'm not gonna look into the camera for most of it. That's because I'm going through some autistic catatonia at the moment. I was traveling for three weeks until recently. I spent two weeks in Slovakia visiting friends, and then I spent a week in London visiting my brother. And for the last two weeks, or maybe a week and a half of my traveling, I was experiencing off and on catatonia. I was experiencing it sometimes, and I still am experiencing it. I'm back at home recovering, basically. So I decided, you know what, in the past, I would have just waited to do this video and recorded it when I was like fully recovered, but I'm trying something new. I'm going to try and record it with very little effort so I can save my energy, but still get this video out before the end of February. So, autistic... This is a coaster, like a thing you put... Um, cups on so you don't get water on the table. And this one always does this. If it gets wet, it sticks to the cup and then it falls down. Very bad design. So what is catatonia? Traditionally, catatonia was only associated with schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is a psych psychological disorder where basically you um, you have hallucinations, you see and hear things that aren't real, or you have delusional beliefs. You believe things that aren't true. Um, schizophrenia is very complicated. There's, there's lots of different types. But basically, um, in the past, catatonia was only associated with schizophrenia. And catatonia is when you struggle to move, you struggle to speak, so you find it hard to move, you find it hard to speak. Maybe you make weird movements, like you twitch, or you move your body in weird ways. You get trapped in certain positions. If someone moves your arm up here, let's say, 
your arm stays there. These are different elements of catatonia, but they do not always happen. Um, some catatonic people experience some of these things and others don't. To be honest, it's not the best defined thing. It's not really, really clear, like this is exactly how catatonia is. And, you know, I'm talking about autistic catatonia, which may be separate from schizophrenic catatonia. Certainly the way I experience it, I, um, I tick some of the boxes. I experience some of the things that are described as classic catatonia symptoms you know, things that happen when you have catatonia, but then there are other things that I don't have. Um, unfortunately, this idea of autistic catatonia is quite new. There is only one book on the subject. I was gonna show you the book and I forgot it. It's downstairs. It came out in 2019. I will put the name of the book in the description, either on Patreon or YouTube. I'll, I'll try and put it on both. Um, so there's only one book about autistic catatonia and with autism, it's kind of, there are already ideas, um, within autism, you know, the study of autism that are similar to catatonia. People talk about shutdowns, which is when your body shuts down, you go quiet, maybe you don't move, um, for a period of time. But the difference is, um, that catatonia can be much more extreme. Uh, it can take place over a very long time. And um, shutdowns tend to happen in response to emotional things, whereas catatonia can really just happen seemingly at random. Like it can seem like there's no reason for the catatonia, it just happens. So my case of catatonia, <laughs> I want to say it's not so extreme because when I read this book about autistic catatonia, they talked about, you know, people who couldn't eat because they were finding it hard to lift up the spoon. They couldn't go outside. They couldn't lead a normal life, essentially. They, they couldn't, you know, live uh, independently at all. Um, so if I compare myself to that, I'm definitely not an extreme case of catatonia, but I did lose the ability to speak for three months last year. I had days where, you know, I couldn't get out of bed for hours or I couldn't go outside easily or I was struggling to do a lot of basic stuff. Um, I've never been frozen in a position for hours, but I have been stuck in one position for, you know, 30 minutes. And that's a really scary feeling, especially because I've read about these extreme cases of catatonia. And for some people, you know, they even have problems with their hearts and breathing because they basically completely lose control of their body. So mine is not so extreme, but it does seem to be a form of catatonia. So um, I kind of, now that I have more experience with it, um, both from last year and then these recent episodes I've been having, I decided I would kind of break down what happens because it's not really clear cut. Clear cut means you know, there's a strict difference. It's not like that. It's not like there's on and off. There are levels. So for me, the, the two things are loss of speech and loss of movement. And there are like five levels for both. So for loss of speech, level zero is fluent performance. So this is when I have no catatonia. And by fluent performance, I mean, I can talk in any context. I can perform, like I can do an episode of Easy Stories in English with lots of enthusiasm and I can do all the voices, I can speak in different languages, you know, it's normal level. In fact, maybe not even normal level because that means I can do things like public speaking, which a lot of people find difficult. Level one of speech loss is when I find it hard to pronounce words sometimes, like maybe I say some words wrong, 
and sometimes it takes me a time sometimes it takes me a few seconds to um find the word i want to say sorry i'm gonna turn that off um level two of loss of speech is when i'm really slow at processing so processing is your brain like working through the language and that's usually with understanding so when i'm at this level or lower i have to ask people to slow down don't talk too fast and don't change the topic too much if you keep changing the topic i can't follow and similarly it's harder for me to process the language as i speak um and in this level if i'm talking to someone and they suddenly change the topic or they interrupt me I can shut down and go completely non-verbal or non-speaking. Level three is when I can say a few words or I can talk on specific topics, but it's very specific what I can talk about. And it's usually only with specific people that I'm comfortable with that I can still communicate. And then level four is when I have no words at all. I simply cannot speak. For loss of movement, level zero is when I'm moving energetically, I can run, I can do exercise, I can dance. Um, level one of loss of movement means I can do pretty much everything, but I can't do things like jump or do strenuous exercise. So strenuous exercises, like exercise that requires a lot of energy, like dancing or lifting weights. At level two, I start walking more slowly. It takes me a long time to get somewhere, for example. At level three, I I kind of find it hard to coordinate my body. Like if if I'm inside, I might use furniture to like support me, to like push me up somewhere. Um, my movements are quite jerky, jerky, like not smooth. Um, sometimes I use really weird movements or really weird positions. Like I might walk like this, or I might just start making movements like this. And sometimes I will make like facial movements. These are called um, stereo, sorry, they're called stereotypies or stereotypies, depending on the pronunciation or ticks. And so I sometimes make ticks with my hands or I might make facial ticks like, obviously if I'm in public, if I'm outside and I'm doing this, people will probably think I'm crazy or I'm taking drugs. So it can be dangerous. I haven't had any problems with this so far, but it could be a problem in the future. Level four is when I completely freeze and I cannot move. And what this feels like is, it's like my brain is sending the message to my muscles to move, but my muscles aren't getting the message. And I might be trapped in a weird position. Like I might be like this and I can't move. And I might like, this might be the most movement I can do. And I can be sending that message like move, move, move for quite a long time, but sometimes it doesn't, um, it doesn't do anything, you know? Um, so that's not very fun. So what triggers catatonia? When something triggers something, it starts it, right? It activates it. And unfortunately, there's not really clear triggers, at least with my catatonia. Sometimes it is an emotional trigger. This tends to especially happen with losing speech, going nonverbal. If something very emotional happens to me, I get my feelings hurt, then I might shut down. And this is maybe more of like a traditional autistic shutdown. And I have been wondering sometimes if it's like physical triggers, because I've had it happen several times over the past few years that I start working out, I start doing weight training and I have a routine for several weeks and it's going well. And then at a certain point, 
I don't feel like my muscles hurt. It's not that my body hurts, but one day I wake up and I just can't do the workout. My body doesn't want to do it. And that's very frustrating. So it could be a physical trigger as well, um, but it's it's not like, it doesn't seem to be the kind of traditional tiredness you get from working out. Often though, the catatonia just comes randomly. Like I can't predict it. The only thing that seems to be the case is stress, right? Like it's caused by stress, which is pretty much, I think, why I had this really long period of catatonia last year. And then this year, I think it probably happened because I've been traveling a lot and doing lots of things. And that's just a lot of experiences, a lot of stress. Often the stress is sensory stuff. As I said, autistic people find it hard to be in places with bright lights, loud sounds. Maybe there's certain food that we don't like the feel of, you know? Um, but it's very unpredictable. I can't really know what's going to cause it. And all I can really do is rest. The thing is, there is a balance between rest and active rest. So rest is when you just let your body rest, right? You don't do anything. And then active rest for me are things that they take energy, like I need energy to do them, but they make me feel better in the long run because they um, they give me energy, they make me happy, they make me feel part of a community, they give me creative ideas. So I have to find the balance. So I kind of, in my head, while I was planning this video, I came up with a scale and on um, one end of the scale, you've got things that are fully restful, right? And then on the other end, you've got things that are stressful. And the thing is, things that are stressful, there are lots of things that are stressful, but they do fulfill me. They do like, they are very important to me. But the active rest things tend to be a bit more in the middle or more on this end, right? So for example, zero is sleep that's that's just rest, right? And that can be literally just lying down with your eyes closed and not listening to anything, not reading, doing nothing. I did a lot of this kind of rest last year and it is really important. Um, and then maybe a number one on the scale is playing video games. I have to have a bit of energy, but I can really just relax and enjoy it. Then reading a book, is number two, takes a bit more energy, but I really enjoy it and it's very relaxing. Number three is taking a bath. It takes a bit more energy because of the sensory stuff, but I feel really great after having a bath. Number four might be going for a walk. So these are all kind of things that are more restful than, than stressful. So if I'm really, really tired and really catatonic, I will just do these things. And then on the other end, let's say at a six for energy level, we have writing or cooking. These are creative activities that I love doing. And when I have the energy, but I'm, it's like sometimes I'm physically tired, but um, I have emotional energy. Like I want to do something creative and that's, you know, that's what I want to, um, no, sorry, it's when I'm emotionally tired, but I have some physical energy. So after doing all of this really restful stuff, after I have some energy, I can do things like writing and cooking. At an eight might be going to a social event. I love going to social events. I love socializing, but it does take a lot of energy. Number nine, recording a podcast. It takes a lot of energy. This video I'm doing right now, because I'm doing it at like a, in a very relaxed way and I'm not editing it, it's probably like a six or a seven, which is good because normally it would be like an eight or a nine. And then number 10 is teaching a class. It takes a lot of energy to teach. 
and I don't feel like I can teach like this. Like I, I don't want to teach without the right level of energy, you know? So yeah, I also have some tests I can do if I'm not sure like what my energy level is, or I'm not sure if I'm experiencing catatonia. Like I wake up and I'm like, I feel a bit better today, but I'm not sure if I'm up for doing a full day of work. I do a few tests. So for physical energy, I try jumping. Uh, actually, let me try this now. So if I try jumping, yeah, I can't jump. <laughs> That's what happens. Like, I'm at, oh my God, earthquake. I'm at that level of catatonia where I can move and I can do this, but I can't jump. So that's how I test for like loss of movement. And then for loss of speech, like I said, the one of the most tiring things I can do is record a podcast because I have to use a lot of uh, energy and speak really clearly. So I try saying, welcome to Easy Stories in English, the podcast that will take your English and so on. But as you can see, I'm not saying it today with my full energy. I can't say it the way I normally do. Therefore, I don't have the energy to record an episode of Easy Stories in English today. So these past few weeks while I was traveling, that was the first time I've experienced like serious catatonia while traveling. The other times it's happened, I've been very close to home. And that was scary. That was quite scary because I had some pretty bad episodes. I had one episode in public where I completely lost the ability to move, but I was with a friend so I could get his help. Um, but this is one of those things that I was scared of happening before. Fortunately, it seems like my body will allow me to just have enough energy until I'm with someone. Um, if I'm alone, like I can keep going even if very slowly, but once I'm with a safe person and I know like they can help me, my body can just go, my body can just collapse, right? But it was really great to, I mean, it was not great to have the catatonia, obviously, but it was really great to get help from friends because it made me realize, oh, I can live with this. I can go out, I can travel with catatonia. Obviously I can't do everything that I would do normally, but it's possible. The medication I'm on also seems to help. As I've said before, I'm on ADHD medication. Um, there's been several days where I woke up and I was quite catatonic and I could not get out of bed but I took my medication and a few hours later, I could get up. So even if I'm experiencing some catatonia, the ADHD makes it easier, or I guess it makes me less likely to experience the really extreme catatonia. It's complicated. But anyway, after having this experience with going catatonic while traveling, and getting help from friends. I wrote a little document for, um, to explain to people how to help me if I'm going catatonic or nonverbal. Um, like how to tell if I'm catatonic and what you can do to help me. I will put this document in the description I was going to go through all of it, but I think that would be too long. This video is already 25 minutes long. So I will just summarize. I'll go through because I have it here. So people can know if I'm going catatonic or nonverbal because I, I do this to show I can't speak or I look very distant. I look shut down. I'm not making eye contact. Maybe I'm not moving, like I'm stuck in one position, but I'm like twitching a part of my body or I'm 
A way I might show I need help is I'll move my eyes around or blink a lot. And then um, what should people do if I am catatonic? First of all, don't, the don'ts, the things they should not do. One, don't tell me, come on, get up, do this. That makes it worse. If someone tells me to do something when I am catatonic, it just makes it worse. Especially if I was trying to think, sometimes I'm actually thinking about getting up and trying to move my muscles. And when I get the order, it's like it cuts my thoughts and I can't think. It's like it, it interrupts the processing of my own movement. I don't want people to assume that I want to be left alone. Sometimes when I'm catatonic, people think I just need some alone time. And sometimes that is the case, but often it's like, my water bottle is over there and I need a drink of water or I need to eat food or I need to go to the toilet and I need help to be able to do that. And if you leave me alone, I'm gonna sit here in an uncomfortable position for a very long time. Don't freak out, don't panic and go crazy because that's just making me more stressed. And it really doesn't have to be a terrible situation. If you help me in the ways I explain, then um, the problem can be solved quite quickly, usually. Don't think that this is an emotional thing, because it's not always. You know, sometimes when people help me, they say, it's okay, I'm here. I don't need that. Just be calm and clear. It's not always an emotional thing. Usually I don't want it to be emotional. If I am trying to talk when I am catatonic, don't, don't stroke me, don't touch me, because then it's harder to process language. When I'm catatonic, it's like touch, especially movement, is so distracting. Now the do's, the things you should do to help me when I am catatonic. One, ask yes, no questions. If I can't talk, I can't answer your questions. Don't ask me what should, what do you want me to do? Because one, I can't answer. And two, that's a lot of thinking. But if you ask, do you want me to help? I can answer yes or no. And if I can't talk, I can probably go mm or blink. So I can do mm for yes and mm, mm for no, or one blink for yes and two blinks for no. And let's say you want to ask me um, if you should help me, you, you want to know what I want and how you could help me. So you could ask, do you want help? Yes. Do you want help getting up? Yes. Do you want to go to the bathroom? No. Do you want to go to the kitchen? Yes. Do you want me to lift you and help you go to the kitchen? Yes. So that's an example of using a series of yes, no questions to find out what I need. Do speak slowly and give me time to process before responding. Sometimes it looks like I didn't hear you, but I did. I just need a long time to process my answer. Do give me a phone to write on because um, when I can't talk, I can usually still write on a phone and then show you the message or play the message. I don't think there has been a time where I was so catatonic that I couldn't write on a phone. Once someone gives me the phone, you know, and unlocks it or whatever, it's usually fine. Do help me move with physical encouragement. So the strange thing with catatonia is um, sometimes it's like I'm stuck, but if you just give me enough of a push, it solves it. So for example, do ask, right? Like, let's say I'm stuck like this. You could say, do you want me to move your arms? And sometimes you just literally need to move my arms and then I can move. Sometimes I need help getting up, like I need you to pull my arms up and then I can get up myself. Um, 
Obviously do ask before you help someone with this kind of thing. It's not nice to just be pulled. I find often people are very, very gentle with these things. Like they're like, and actually sometimes it's like, no, be firm. Another example, when I'm not fully catatonic, but I'm like walking really slowly, if you link arms with me, then I can walk at your speed if you're not walking too fast. So that's another example. And finally, do help me move to a better sensory space. So if we're in, if we are in a very bright room, a very loud room, take me somewhere that is less overwhelming so I can recover because then I can usually process language better. If all of these things are done, if I'm in a safe environment with safe people, I can usually recover very quickly and I can communicate through speech. I'm very good at asking for what I need. So if I can write a message, I will literally be like, do this, do that. And then when I get their help, it's great. So I wrote that document and I sent it to a few friends, two friends actually, three people who have all helped me when I am catatonic. And they all said it was really useful and it's really great to have such clear instructions. And it makes me feel um, empowered. You know, it makes me feel like I, I, I'm, I'm strong and I'm independent and I'm taking control. And on my phone now, so I have some things on my home screen and I have this guide for what to do when I'm catatonic on my home screen. So if I'm with a person who doesn't know how to help with this stuff, I can just open my phone and show them this and then they can figure out how to help me. Um, Cause the, the hardest thing is asking for help. And I used to be worse at it, but um, now I've pretty much had to learn to do it. So yeah. So what about the long-term treatment of catatonia? Is it possible to completely cure it? I don't know. <laughs> like I said, there's one book on autistic catatonia and the advice it gives for treatment is mainly for more extreme cases, but it's all kind of obvious stuff like reduce stress, spend more time in nature, spend more time doing activities that you're passionate about, right? Like these are all just things to generally recover from burnout and have a good life. Recently, I have been thinking that it might also be linked to trauma. Trauma or traumatic experiences are really difficult experiences that you go through that, um, you know, where something is very dangerous and you don't have any power in that situation and therefore you end up uh, permanently damaged by the experience. So traditionally trauma, we think of being in the war or being abused by a family member when you're young. I don't have traumas that extreme, but I have had traumatic experiences. And recently I've been reading a book called The Body Keeps the Score, which is all about trauma, how it affects the brain, how the brain works and various types of therapy. And some of these therapies are really interesting. So I'm thinking maybe uh, this catatonia is somehow linked to trauma. And I want to try some of these alternative therapies like acupuncture. Acupuncture is when they put needles in you. It's like that uh, traditional Chinese therapy. EMDR, I don't remember what EMDR is short for. It's a therapy where um, you think through traumatic experiences while moving your eyes in a certain way. And the rapid eye movement um, puts you in a state like when you're dreaming at night and allows you to creatively imagine a solution to the trauma, like a, a, a world where the traumatizing thing didn't happen and you were okay. Also, neurofeedback is one I just read about 
where it's um, using computer programs um, that connect using electrodes to the brain um, and it basically helps you change your brain waves to be more relaxed. So I kind of want to try these alternative therapies. Some of them are quite expensive, <laughs> so I don't know if that will happen. But um, there are basically very, very few people who specialize in autistic catatonia. As far as I know, there are no therapies that are like specifically proven to work for autistic catatonia. So all I can really do is experiment. And here's the thing, if this is caused by stress, then all I can do is reduce stress in my life. Therefore, I don't try, well, I try not to see the catatonia as such a problem. Traditionally, you know, people would, I don't know, I feel like in society, the word disabled has um, a lot of weight, you know. Uh, I called myself disabled in a conversation with my mom, and she said, oh, but do you really think of yourself as disabled? And I think when other people see me, they think I should, you know, think of myself in two ways, when I'm good and healthy, and then when I have catatonia, and ideally, I'll get back to being good and healthy, and everything will be fine. But that's simply not reality. That's not how it works. It's, as I've said, there are levels and, you know, maybe it will never go away. And that's something I have to accept. Because if I don't accept that and I stress out about the catatonia and I live in fear of the catatonia, it's just going to make the catatonia worse, right? There's this idea that, oh, if you call yourself disabled, then you're giving up on being cured. And that's not the case. I have to live with this. And I am living with it. You know, I was traveling with it. I'm working with it. Right? Um, but I'm not stressing about it. And if I do find it stressful or scary, then I talk to people about it. <sighs> so yeah. That's my video about autistic catatonia. Thank you for watching. Um, I'm aware that this must seem very strange. If you have just listened to my podcast and you're used to Ariel with lots of energy and happy Ariel, you might be like, oh, you seem so different in this video, but that's just life, you know? I'm experiencing catatonia and I'm living with it. And I'm not going to hide because I think if I only make videos and podcasts when I'm fully, you know, completely fine and I never talk about my catatonia, I'm saying that it's something bad and I should be ashamed and I don't feel shame, right? I know some people will find it strange or not understand it, but I don't feel shame. I don't. So in a way, making this video is quite an important step, I guess. I'm just kind of showing the world. Also, because there are very few resources online about autistic catatonia. There are very few people on YouTube who can talk about this experience and how it feels for them. So I think it's important to put this out there. <sighs> anyway, thank you for watching. If you do have any questions, leave a comment. And yeah, I'll see you soon. Bye.